So encrypting is a two-way process. So when you use some kind of means to change the text in this case, and encryptions go way back. One of the, you know, one of the famous ones is the Julius Cipher, uh, Julius Caesar. And basically it would, you would pick a, say the fourth letter of the alphabet, you know, four. And so an A becomes, you move it over four times, B, C, D, E. So, and if you know which step you've taken on the alphabet, when you get it, you can reverse it by doing the opposite of what you did to encrypt it. So encryption allows you to take plain text, jumble it up, send it to the other side. And if they have a key or a means to know how to reverse it, then they reverse it and they get plain text on the other side. Okay. And there's a lot of really good um, in, you know, different tools online that you can use um, like this one right here. This is online tools here. So you can put in hello and you can encrypt it using some means and you get this encryption. Now, the way that you know it's encryption is if you can decrypt it by using that. Okay, so this is encryption. We took hello, we did a bunch of random generate stuff to it. We got this back. I send this across the web. You know the secret. You get this and you return this and you can say, Zach said hello. Hashing on the other end is one way. Um, MD5 hash. Well, uh, and so hashing you still jumble it up, but there's no way to take it and reverse it. So when you hash something, we'll say, hello, uh, we'll say, hello team. Okay, so I'm gonna hash this using MD5. And with MD5, we get this back. Now, if we try to decrypt, if you would, this hash, and we run it and we say, hey, wait a minute, this is not a known series of keys. Now you can use a rainbow table. and There are a few ways to get through easier hashes. But the bottom line is there's no easy way to validate this. So that's the first thing that matters with hashing. That you can, I can send this to anybody. And unless you know what it means, you don't know what it means. The second thing about hashing is that they are, if you make any change to it, the hash becomes significantly different. And so I'm gonna grab some lorem ipsum real quick. And we're going to, because it's much more impressive when you get to see it in a large scale. So we're gonna take everything here that's highlighted and we're going to hash that. Now, the thing about a hash is that the length of the hash will always be the same regardless of how much input, all right? And so you can see the length here. We'll put all of this in and we get the exact same length of a hash. And I'm gonna copy this just so that we have a means to look at it. Because I've found the hardest part about understanding how JWTs work is that nobody understands hashing. Yeah. So we have this incredibly huge amount of text. If I make any change in here, this hash makes a drastic change. So let's say I decide I'm going to remove this dot. Oh, I didn't generate last time, hold on. This is our generation here. Right? And so somewhere I removed a dot, right? Does, and I think we can probably, I think I put the dot right here. So this is with the dot removed. If I put, make any kind of change, notice I get this really different hash. So this is why hashing is used in say cryptocurrencies. 
um, because you can't make any change in here at all, a space. I mean, how hard is it to find a, a change in space? But notice that the hash is drastically different. And it's one way. We don't have a way to take this line of code or text and get this entire paragraph back out of it. So when we're hashing a password, the concept behind that is, is that we take the password and I'll show you something interesting. So we'll hash password. This is our password. And we want to be able to send it and store it so that nobody else knows what, what it is. And that's why we use a hash. We don't want anybody to technically be able to reverse engineer it. Now, that said, if I take this hash of password MD5, notice that instantly it's already been hashed. We know what that hash is. It's password. So if you encrypt using MD5 without a salt, and you may, or if you hash it using MD5 without a salt, password is easily hacked. And the reason that easily hacked is because we have rainbow, rainbow tables. And a rainbow table is a list of somebody that went through and, and they went, okay, what is the hash of one? What is the hash of two? What is the hash of one, one? What is, and they've done that uh, with MD5. We have it up to about 14 characters long. So any password that's less than 14 characters long that's in MD5, we already have it. So we don't have to be able to reverse engineer it because we just compare the hash to a database of hashes and we say, oh, that hash has already been uh, structured such. And that's where salt comes in. And so salting is when we do something to our hash algorithm that changes it. So we, we know, and the other thing that's really important is that when you hash the same thing again, you get exactly the same result. So we hash password again, notice if we do a search for it, We're going to, oops, I want to search. But I mean, you can see that this, this hash is well known. That's why you don't use password as your password because everybody knows what the hash is. So a salt is when you add something to it that you know the system that you use, but nobody else necessarily does. And even if they know the system that you use, they don't have a way to pinpoint it. So let's say that with every password, right, that we encrypt or we use the hash um, algorithm and we add the, the time. So right now for me, it's 6, 28, and say 54 seconds. And we generate it. Now this is completely different. And if I try to generate this and I go check it, nobody has a clue what it is. And even though you know that at any given time, I use the time down to the second to include in your hash, you don't know when they created that, right? So even if you use a create time, I mean, you can, you can start to get really obnoxious with it, but you would have to know that it was exactly that second that it was done. And most of them use the Unix time, which is milliseconds or yeah, milliseconds all the way from 1970. And so you'd have to know to the thousandth of a second, because if you make any change whatsoever, this is 2870. If you thought, oh, well, I think they did it at this time. Well, that's completely different. Okay. So what happens is, we know that this is the method that we're using. Right, so I'm gonna go back to 54 and you create a user. So we create a user and we're using this timestamp. This is when it was done and their password is password one. And 
you go through the, and we'll go through the steps of the actual code, but I want you to conceptually understand this. So it happens at this time, you generate the hash and we say, this is the, so this is the password hash that gets stored in the database. When you come back again, the, and you want to log in again, whatever method we used here, this salt method has to be something that's, that's algorithmically sound because what's going to happen is you're going to enter your password as password one. And the user has to do this and the algorithm that you use has to be able to compare this. That's the compare sync. So when we use bcrypt, they handle all of this, all the special stuff. The only thing that the user or the developer has to know is they have to have a space for password and you have to know how many times you cycle it. And the way that that works is imagine we have our password here and every time we hash, we add a one to it and we use the previous hash as part of the key. So the first time it generates, we copy that. And then this goes after the password. And this is our first generation. And we generate, we take this and we generate, we paste that in there and we generate, etc. So this becomes to get, becomes very, very complicated to reverse engineer. And let me let somebody in. So from this standpoint, are there any questions? I mean, I'm sure there's questions, but do you understand from a high level what's happening? The user creates a password, there's the bcrypt algorithm that's happening, and you as the developer determine how many times it's gonna loop. It does its thing, you take the output, you store it in the database. When they come back again, Claire says good, come back again, the user enters their password, the, in the code, right, we tell it hash 10 times or 12 or 18 or whatever. And then it runs it through and it compares it. So at the end, when the user comes back, that and goes <laughs> through the process and regenerates that hash, the two have to match. If those two match, then they're authenticated. So from a high level, that's what's happening. Now let's look at the code. All right. So we're going to start with register. <laughs> and so the register endpoint is the A put, right? So that means we are creating. And when they access that endpoint, they're sending a rec.body. Now remember, when we're testing it, of course, we send that rec.body in Insomnia or a, you know, Postman or whatever tool you're using. But normally that comes from the sign-in form built on the front end. And they send a username and a password. We assign that to user. And then what we do immediately is we take their password, which is plain text. We then pass that in to the hash function and we tell it the number of times. And that runs through this process that we did over here and spits out the hash and we then reassign that value to the user password. And the reason that you want to do that right off the bat is you don't want that password to be anywhere loose in code, right? You want it to be sent HTTPS, so that it's encrypted asymmetrically through TLS system, which is a whole different part, but all you care about is the S. You send that, nobody can intercept that. And if they do, it's already encrypted. It gets to the computer, it decrypts that, runs it through this process, and we have this hash now as the username. At that point, it's some kind <laughs> of humble mess. Okay. And then we, However we go about it, we create our user. 
This one's using promises. I prefer async await. But the bottom line is we take our model, we add that user, and we save it. Done. Everything's easy, right? Now, when we log in, this is where it gets a little more tricky. Again, it's a post, so they're sending a rec.body. And we typically, it's always going to be username or password or some <laughs> kind of der you know, derivation thereof. Um, generally, I would recommend that you stay away from username and use email instead. Um, anyone know why you should why using email is a great strategy? There's three of them that are kind of stand out. Come on now, I'm gonna start calling on people. Otherwise, I am a professor. <laughs> oh, I think Dion's got an answer. Oh, did I still unmute myself? <laughs> well, I thought you were doing that so that you could uh, provide an answer. No, I don't even know how I clicked the button. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> so the there are three reasons. The big two. One, email addresses are unique around the world. So it's very easy to keep everybody separated because they're already separated by email address because they're all unique. Two, you already have their email address, so it makes it very easy to confirm, reset passwords, those kind of things. And three, we're moving to a much more standardized single sign-on, third-party kind of authentication, which is almost always email anyway. So things like Google, Facebook, Twitter, GitHub, Okta, all of those use email. So I would recommend that you get in the habit of using email and password. That way it makes integration with other tools. In the world, you're never going to do this. You're never going to handle your own authentication. And if you're, somebody's paying you, please, for all that is holy, do not write your own authentication. The reason we teach this is so that you begin to understand the authentication flow so that you have a understanding of what's happening. But when you're dealing with customers, do not bear the risk of your own. Use Firebase, Auth0, Passport.js. Uh, don't use Okta. We use Okta, you know, students for login. Oh, they suck for trying to build. I do you know, oh, stay away from them. Passport, JS, Auth0, or Firebase. The best three that, uh, and Firebase is the absolute easiest. Um, and so get in that habit. Now, once we log in, right, we are going to find the user or email. We're going to ensure that, the, that they are a real user. And then if they are a user, we want to compare the password that they sent us up here, that the user sends us, with the user information that we found already in the database. And this, com will, this compare sync takes the password of the user, it hashes it, and then all it does is say, does this password make hash? equal the password hash that we have saved. If it does, you're golden. You're allowed to move on. If not, invalid user. Again, I think that you may have to think it through kind of one or two times, but that process, very easy. Right? You're just comparing two strings. Does this one match this one? Yep, nope, no problem. Now, JWT, is a little bit different. And JWT, if we go to JWT, so if you go to JSON Web Token, also called JOTS, I just feel like I'm stumbling, verbally stumbling. See, I can't even say the two words together. Verbally stumbling, saying JOT. Um, so I'll stick with JWT, or most people just call them tokens. Now, a token, a JWT token, is a standard of hashing that is known to everybody. There are no secrets in that other than one little bitty line right here. 
and that's to verify your signature. So when we look at this, this is made up of three parts. So we have said, hey, user, you're allowed. Now you have two options. You can do, actually, well, you can do three, three options. You can do a cookie with a session. So the session is stored on the server and it sends when you connect, it creates the session, sends a cookie, and then the cookie's on the front end. And usually you can go, you know, you can go to about any, let's go to GitHub. Who look at this mess. GitHub status, if you go to inspect, you can go to your application and you have cookies. And this tells you what cookies are. And so if you've logged in to something that requires a cookie, then you'll have some cookie information. See this? Google sets all of these different kinds of cookies, right? And so the cookie is client side, the session is server side. And every time you try to access the, with the session, you then have this cookie and it says, yay. The second option is JWT. And here, this gets added to your header, your authorization header, and it has certain information inside of it. And part of that is the verified token or this verified signature. And then the third option is to use sessions with cookies and the information in the cookie is a JWT. Both sides have their pros and cons. It's hard to destroy one, the other is easy to read. So you, by mixing them up and having a combination, then, you know, you, you provide more, more security. Now you have to have this, and this is passed inside of headers, which is much more complicated to steal from an outside source. But if they have access to your computer or then they can get this. And by having this, they represent you. So again, this is why you don't build your own. You use somebody else's service. But the JWT has three parts. It has this header. And this header information is just about always the same. Usually it's going to be HS256. And if you, you can see again here, this, um, if you were to change something here, notice this changes completely. So this is EYJ IFQ. But if we go back to this one, EYJ CJ9. So any change changes this up dramatically. The second part is the payload. And that's what we'll create here. And the payload is whatever information you've decided to attach with it. So maybe we also want to have, let's say, we want to have a role so that we can define them. And here we're gonna say that they're uh, uh, sales. Right? <clears throat> so, this middle part or the purple part is the payload. And that information is what we create right here. And then finally, we have the signature. Now the signature is where your secret, that's this part right here, this secrets that you go in and you create the secret password. And here we're going to say, we're going to make our secret. Notice every time I make a change, it changes dramatically. We're going to call our secret chocolate. Okay. So remember that because we're going to use it in a second. So if you've written your code properly, the secret is not available to the front end. When you deploy this, you'll use your .env, which we don't even have one in here, probably because uh, it sh should be blocked by the gitignore. Um, yeah. Okay. So, you'll, but when you deploy it, you have to set up your keys and that becomes the replacement for this study and file. So this is the thing that you have to protect at all costs because that is how this is configured. So the middle part doesn't make any difference. It's this one secret that makes all the difference in the world. So I have this JWT here. I'm going to open jwt.io again. 
And so we can kind of compare the original. So this is what it looked like, and we're only worried about the blue part. So F, uh, S, L, F, uh, S, F, L, there we go, versus F, W, B. And so they're dramatically different. And we can take the rest of this, copy, come over here and paste it. Notice that we get John Doe, this IAT, the roles of sales, all of this is still accessible, right? The only thing that really matters is this invalid signature, right? So it compares this signature to this. Now, if we know that it's chocolate because we wrote as such, signature verified. If it's chocolates, right, then, and it, weak secret. Uh, so we have to be careful what we send because it doesn't matter if it's verified or not. The token is still readable. But what we want to know is if the signature is verified. All right, so if we come over and look at our code, we want to generate this token and we're passing in user, which is in this case, probably something similar to this, right? Some kind of information that is related to that user so that you can access it in other places. And you can always use the JWT decode and you can decode this any place in your app and and the front end, and they can get out the name, the username, whatever information is in here. What matters is that they can verify the signature. So if the signature doesn't verify, you don't give them access. And again, you don't have to write that code to tell it to validate and verify and all of that. That's what JWT does. That's it handles that. But it's important that you understand what it's doing. So we generate the token and typically you'll see in the secondary function and you decide what information you want to include. Now you could include other things, right? You could include boss hog that goes to everybody, right? Doesn't make any difference. You can include whatever you want in there. You want to keep it small. You don't want to put their entire life story in there. Because every time you make any transaction, that is getting passed. Right? So you want to keep it as small as you can. But nonetheless, you have plenty of option to add whatever you want. The options, and if you go to JWT, uh, that's not what I want. Options are things that you have additional control over. The most popular ones that you will come across are access token expires, right? Expires in, so that's what this one is. The, if you offer a refresh token, so to make it more complicated, maybe every 12 hours or seven days or something, uh, you want to make it change automatically so that it makes it harder for someone to steal that. Most often you'll see it on, on account creation. And, and so you'll see those accounts where you, it, it says that, uh, you know, it'll send you a link and then you have X amount of time to change your password, right? So what happens is it sends you a link, it creates the token. It says, okay, here you go. This one will let you in. But as soon as you get in, it's only good for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. You have to then create a new password and then log in again. And then you'll get maybe a 30 day one. Uh, banks, you know, are typically like five minutes after you don't make any, you know, any kind of movement inside of the app. But ultimately, it's just a control method. Now, I'll give you a hint. Don't make it too short when you're building your back end project <laughs> for build week. Uh, you can set it as fast as you want, but it gets to be a real pain when you're trying to uh, develop and you, you don't want to have to sign in 
constantly to get a new token. So make it a day or five days or something. Okay. But you have others. You can change your algorithm, right? HS256 is kind of the standard, but you can change it. And then you have, you can make private keys and public keys and secret keys, right? That's our secret. Um, all of these things are available. At some point, it's worth looking. Cookie secure, if you're creating cookie to go along with it. Same site. All of these things are available to you. And, and JWT, which is created by Auth0, well, I've already closed it, but um, which is one of the ones I recommend for you to use um, for authentication. I mean, they wrote the book, they wrote the code literally. So, you know, they know what they're doing. So the JWT, the password is hashed. The JWT then takes whatever information you want and makes a signature and passes that back to the user. And that's why we return it the way that we do in our status 200 with our message and the token. And then that's when you have to take the token. And if you're testing it, of course, you have to put it in the header, the authorization header, and put that in there so that you can access your, your code, right? Otherwise, you should be getting an invalid credential. On the front end, they do, you know, you remember, you should remember in two, in unit two, and then you, you should have done it again in unit three, where you take that back and you have, you take the token, you add that to the header um, so that every time you make a request, that header is sent, it's validated, the signature is confirmed. If it's good, you're allowed to continue. Right. Now, checking roles. This is important in the sense that um, it shows you some of the other things, you know, the other options that you, you can do with your JWT, but ultimately it doesn't, there's not a big point that matters. You can decode the JWT and get anything you want, right? And so we saw where we added the role. And then when we decoded it, you get the role no matter what. Anybody has access to that. They can decode it and they can see the role. So that's why that JWT alone is not enough in that anybody can access that. And that's why you have to have that verify signature. That is the most important part. Now, when you want to have a restriction, notice the token comes from the headers, the authorization header. So front end attaches that to the authorization header and they make a request, comes with every request. We want to take the token. We want to verify the token. That's the signature, right? The only thing that we really care about is here's the token, here's the signature. When we compare the two, do they match? If they don't, we air out. Otherwise, we want to just go ahead and decode the token, which is when we decode it, that's our payload. And then we want to take that payload and put that on our rec, on our request. And remember with request, anything we put on the request is available to the next thing in line or anything after that. So then at any point in the line of middleware, we have access to decoded JWT. And so we can pull out username or email or whatever, you know, their role. And we can use that to provide additional access, right? But it's important to know that let's say we sign up, Claire is our admin. So hers, when it de uh, the role will say admin. Now we can take that and copy hers. You're welcome, Claire. <laughs> and, and then we can take Dion, for instance. Now she's a student. So I can take what the template from Claire's, because I have her ax hers, and I can take Claire's or Dion's and I just switch it out. If we don't verify the signature, we're not going to know the difference. So we verify first. Once the signatures verify, then we'll continue. And the other thing too is that it 
we don't really see it, but there's that there's that time to live, right? So when you attach the option of time, and we say one day, when we do the verify, it takes the creation date of that that's stated or the end date that's stated. And when it verifies it, signature is good, but the data is, has passed, the time has passed, it will not verify. And so then you would have to log in, get a new token, and then have access. And that's JWTs in a nutshell. Questions, thoughts, concerns, arguments, complaints, silence. Thought it was very well done. Thank you. You're most welcome. I love hashing. It's wonderful. It's so incredibly cool. When I would teach, I used to, so I've worked on in crypto for a long time. I was one of the founding developers for HTML coin. Still there. We, we started about five months after Bitcoin came out. And it's still there. It's still traded. It's, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars there. And, uh, but blockchain, so crypto is interesting, but blockchain is absolutely amazing. And blockchain does exactly what we showed with how we hash the password. It does the exact same thing, except everything is just made public because you can't tamper with it in that you have to be able to figure out how to change it and still keep everything the same hash. It's absolutely fascinating. If you haven't done it, you can build a, your own blockchain and node in about a hundred lines of code. And you have a full functioning blockchain. You can put it to an endpoint. It's a lot of fun. I highly recommend anybody that wants to get a job, build your own blockchain, and then build a couple of endpoints where it allows you to access that, read it, and write it. There is no updates or deletes. Try it out. It's a really nice project, and I guarantee you it will land you a job. <laughs>